we're well on our way in the 21st century here to connecting the heart and heart-centered approach to life with the mind and the mental approach to life. And um, there's so many misconceptions and I think misunderstandings of what these modes of being are, what do they even mean. Typically you might think of someone working in law or finance or government or things like that as someone who has to be mental and professional and pragmatic and rational and logical and yet all the time we are in those kinds of positions grappling with our heart with our emotion with our feelings oftentimes that is seen as a liability or a weakness to being able to get the job done or being able to perform one's function or duty um, I think this is a mistake. And by that, I don't mean that it's wrong. I just mean that it's not quite understood as to what the function of the heart is within this paradigm. It's obvious that there are lots of scary or undesirable emotional qualities that can arise. And we've learned that these kinds of qualities can lead to confusion and can cloud our judgment and can warp our thinking. And when we lose control of being able to see things in what we consider to be a way that is clear, um, well, that's not great because it just isn't. It's not ideal because it doesn't allow us to function efficiently or effectively or more importantly it doesn't allow us to remain in balance that being kind of the key word here is that there is a balance to be found between heart-centered approaches and mental approaches and we see this divide or this conflict everywhere that we look in whatever swath of society that you're focusing on, you're going to see this um, in any type of industry, in any type of job specialization, in any type of economy. And it's a global phenomenon, obviously, because we're all the same in that humans all have the same basic emotional wiring. You know, there's a little bit of variation here and there, but it's more or less the same. We have much more variety in terms of mental thought and how we can configure our um, our upstairs wiring, our modern electrical wiring in the brain. Um, but in terms of the deeper uh, functions of emotion and especially um, instinctive responses to things and um, automatic responses to things and reflexive responses to things, all that stuff is kind of hardwired. And what we can do is just observe that and notice it and accept it and work with it, not against it. You're not going to... Um, if you try to stop or change or suppress any of those aspects of ourselves, all that's going to do is just waste your entire life's worth of energy trying to stop something that can't be stopped. Um, you can't just turn it off. You can work with it though. You can learn about it. One of the most important skills of this day, this era, and I'm sure it's probably been important all throughout the evolution of our species. It's an advantage to be able to do this, is to be able to find the balance between opposites or between, uh, like hold the balance between, or hold the tension between opposites. Um, because there is, there, is there is a center or a balance point that exists that everything kind of revolves around. And it's not something that we can arrive at in, in a sense that it can't be grasped and it can't be owned and it can't be made into something. And it's not something that, that I can 
achieve. Um, it's only something that can be moved through, around, um, orbited in a way that it's necessary to be able to let go of like linear thinking and to be able to recognize that this chaotic motion and this swirling motion and this endless eccentric orbital motion that's happening around the center, um, that is in a sense kind of what it feels like to be human. And we can feel that balance, like we can feel the balance point that isn't necessarily us and it's not necessarily our physical center of mass as just this body, but we are always moving and we're always changing our shape. So the center of mass is also always moving. Um, it's moving and it's changing. So there's no fixed place to arrive at necessarily, although you know, I don't know that. And there's no knowing it, you know, there's no knowing of it. So we're always in motion, we're always in flux, which if you can get comfortable with it, it's like, all right, okay. You know, it's sometimes we, um, and this is a different kind of motion than the motion that we are, the social pressure that we feel, like when we get in our car, if we have a car, we drive on the street, and we are assaulted, I don't want to say assaulted, but we are immersed in um, so much targeted, directed messages, movements, motions, billboards, advertisements, uh, electromagnetic waves. You know, it's, it, there, there's so much um, coming at us and it wants to throw us in this direction, that direction, or the other. Um, there is a dance that can be done with all of that. It's part of it. However, what it is that I'm talking about is sort of a little bit beyond all of that. That's like a very surface level movement. That's sort of the human mind um, programming or whatever you want to call that. You know, if you tune into those levels, just go, go for a drive and look at all the bright colors and all the words that are trying to capture your attention and sway you one way or the other way. It's deep, it's like, it's, it's, it acts as a certain level of, of the human consciousness that seeks to influence your subconscious behaviors. And um, that is a movement and it is a movement that bears some resemblance to what I'm talking about, but that's not what I'm talking about. It's just, it's a very small part of it. Um, so we can get caught in these l shallow layers of existence, advertising being one of them. Um, not that it's a bad thing, it's just if you want to experience more in life that's something that's more expansive or that's um, deeper or richer or just varied, um, because the advertisement is a very directed, one-track kind of thing that's been going on for a while. Simply having to do with survival, money, and, you know, buying and selling. And that's, that's what we do here in, in a, in a plan <laughs> on a planet of um, scarcity. You know, we don't have enough, there's not enough to go around and all of these messages which may or may not be true. You know, it's... We don't really know. The laws of science and physics and things like this change. In physics, there are the laws of thermodynamics. And I think the most, oh, most well-known law is the law of conservation of energy. Um, Google it, look it up on AI, I suppose, if that's interesting to you. But in that, um, energy is conserved. It is not created. It is not destroyed. And money is energy. Physical resources on the planet are energy. And within this closed system, there are supposedly a finite amount of resources. And we will, con as humans, we will continually expand to consume all of those resources. We don't know if that goes infinite layers out all the way to the end of the universe. We don't know if the laws of physics what we've observed in science, which science is pretty new, honestly. Um, 
at its essence, science is the art of observation. And while it's been turned into a religion, it's not exactly clear what science really is these days. Um, but at its core, it's the art of observation. So as we keep observing, we may, if we're open to it, we may learn something different. We may learn something new. Um, and in fact, there are historical examples of earth shattering, paradigm changing moments where discoveries have been made and suddenly all the old laws and understandings didn't really actually amount to anything, or at least they only provided one very small part of the picture, you know? So I, just to say, I don't know if our resource is truly always going to be scarce because we're always going to expand and consume what there is. And, uh, or is there such a thing as infinite energy or something of that nature? And or is that something that depends on our relationship with the environment, how we choose to consciously relate to the environment? Um, I don't believe that things like greed, for example, I don't believe that that is an endless, impossible, uh, final form of humanity, right? Like. We've been struggling along these lines, greed and anger, hatred, and those kinds of fear-based, attachment-based, self-based emotions. And those seem to kind of hold this really heavy story for us that we've been a part of. I, you know, I don't know if that's going to be true forever. Um, It is my belief that as we continue to create a world where the individual spiritual self is welcome in this world, in a sense that there are social constructs that acknowledge the spirit, that, that are actually informed by the spirit. and. I, maybe things kind of went in that direction back in the day and there was a sort of synergy or maybe a, um, what's the word? Well, there were not really boundaries between what we would consider the church and the state. And the way that played itself out, I would call it religion rather than spirituality. Um, religion became a essentially a controlling dominating force uh, which competed with the state for the right of what it means to be human and what humans deserve and what humans are and how we would codify that into laws and then when you get into trying to prohibit using those as um, restrictive measures to limit people's freedoms for example, not being able to practice spirituality in a form that they prefer, um, then, yeah, it became necessary to separate those two. So it's not exactly what I mean, but maybe there's like a further evolution of that, the church, not church, the spirituality and the state or the government, um, where these things can kind of reunify in a way that is more like symbiotic, more harmonious just a new evolution of that where clearly when governments are, at least the American government was founded as it was built off of obviously some wrong principles and some right principles. For example, uh, hatred of the other hatred of the, whether it's the feminine or different race of people or <laughs> feeling a, a sense of, self versus the the land um, whether we work with harm in harmony with nature or we dominate and subjugate it to our will you know those kinds of misunderstandings of what it actually means to be um, in this world so we weren't necessarily the americans weren't i'm not i'm not one of them i guess my I'm immigrant but but the americans who came over from europe you know weren't necessarily like totally clear on what they were doing. And yet, if you read some of the writings of the founding fathers of America, there were also some clear spiritual principles at play as well. So 
super complex, complicated, just like it is today. Um, and it's like, oh, where we're at now, you know, that there, it doesn't seem very in vogue or popular to care about what happened in the past or learn from the mistakes of history or any of that. You know, there's incomprehensible amounts of history that have been recorded. And in my opinion, I feel like AI could be a wonderful tool to actually synthesize all of that history from a like data analysis or analytical point of view and see if we can draw some really poignant lessons from all of the repeated cycles of events that have happened through recorded history. Um, that would be like a scientific approach to it. And I'm sure individual historians and groups of historians and researchers have tried to do that, but like there's only so much that the individual human mind can comprehend and contain. But if we could just AI that, <laughs> figure out what it is that humans have been doing for the last however many millennia and take the lessons we can from that and then discard what isn't working and just streamline the process. Um, not to use AI as the sole means of self-reflection and decision-making, just to use it as a tool or to perhaps allow for the fact that it may very well be another layer of our mental evolution process, um, which used to be kind of inside our brains, but now it's going to be out, outside of our brains, and that's fine. But I was talking about history, I guess, and I don't. I, I hated history class when I was a student, and I never enjoyed reading. Oh well, yeah, no, I never enjoyed reading about American history. Um, I found ancient civilization somewhat interesting, but that was in like middle school or elementary school. <laughs> so I did not study. I'm not like a. I don't know much about this, but I'm just assuming there are lessons in there somewhere for those who are interested. Um, can't really remember why I was talking about that. Yeah. So this just kind of points to how, you know, at least for my mind, and I think a lot of people nowadays, with the way we have engineered our social media situation, blah, 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 social media situation, the way that our brains have lost the ability to focus for long periods of time and lost the ability to retain, comprehend, synthesize information. And maybe that's just, I mean, it's obviously not just me. Um, I'm saying, I'm sure some of you out there are really capable at this, but I think most people are not. And that is not necessarily a failing of the human project. In fact, it may just be pointing us in a different direction. Maybe it's just that hyper parallel processing and distributed shared networks, as we've seen in things like cloud computing and in cryptocurrency or DeFi, decentralized finance, um, that this way of sharing, or you know, even back in the day with peer-to-peer uh, -peer file sharing, this way of sharing information, it may be sort of actually how our brains are adapting to the climate or the universe or whatever's going on around us, and recognition of the fact that we're not going to evolve and achieve divinity or whatever you want to call it, um, um, perfection or the best versions of ourselves solely through our individual human brains and our individual selves. Like that's not happening. Um, AI already is going to wipe that idea right off the board really, really quickly. Now, granted, of course, anything can happen. Like as we saw, we had some solar um, solar storms recently that could have been a little bit more disruptive. And, you know, that there's always these possibilities of kind of more catastrophic events that could 
whoo, wipe out the electrical grid and, you know, that would set us back to who knows, or where, well, who knows, I'm not going to speculate on that. But assuming we continue along the path we've been going, electricity, computers, semiconductors, and all of that. Um, Wi-Fi is improving quickly, 5G, 6G, 7G, and before you know it, etc. We should kind of arrive at a point of fairly instantaneous communication. And it's still clunky right now, but eventually it may get to a point where it's, who knows? You know, there, there are the, we waste a lot of time and resources and energy on security and privacy and all of that. Um, but if we ever do get to a point where there is more of an open source kind of situation, um, which would require a total, total reconstruction of economic principles. So moving beyond capitalism, moving beyond communism and moving beyond, you know, all of that. Uh, I don't know what that would look like. So it's, it's fine and good to talk about it in theory, but then when you look at the actual reality of, of it, it's, you know, it's a big, <laughs> a big, heavy, complex thing, machine. Um, so much of this to me can only be achievable through a relinquishing of like, of the separation and differentiation between any kind of human tribes whether it's the workplace tribe, the family tribe, the country tribe, or whatever. You know, it, 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 it's, it's a tough sell. But I don't think that it would necessarily lead to all humans being identical or the same. Or I feel like there is so much rich uniqueness within us anyway that it doesn't... Just, be, just because we're all working on the same project doesn't necessarily mean that we all have to become the same person because there are so many infinite different functions or roles to be played that are existing in dimensions or levels that aren't really apparent yet. So even if on the physical level, robots and AI take over most of our work, that doesn't actually necessarily mean that we're going to just be nothing and relax and do nothing and chill. There's actually a tremendous amount of work that can be done on subtler levels um, when we're not spending all of our time focusing on eating food and cooking food and driving our cars to and from work and whatever it is that, that we have to do all day long. It doesn't mean, oh, okay, we're just gonna relax. Like, obviously that's, um, I think that's an unfounded, is that even a fear? Do, are people even afraid of that? Not that it would be that bad, but it would be kind of boring, I guess. Society will need to be radically changed on so many levels. And we have new emerging stories. There's so many new stories that are coming up. And I think, I believe that the ones that are most conducive to the greatest good will be the ones that take hold. That's my belief. Um, not a belief. It's actually not. It's a hope. Not even a hope. It's just a unknowing because I guess I do believe in the inherent goodness of humanity like to me that is what defines life is that it is um, to have a heart mind capable of comprehending this means and maybe that's just me and some people maybe it's not everyone but means that this is good and that we are good um, if you've ever had a single experience of compassion, um, that's enough to sort of supersede everything else. Um, it's not something that you kind of forget and then say, oh, well, I guess I'll just go back to mucking around. Like it's so much more important, so much more true um, than anything else. So. And I guess that's the spiritual element of it is that the more, um, not that spiritual awakening guarantees some sort of good behavior or good action to emerge from it, but it definitely pushes you in that direction and you can't get off the track once you're on the track. So it's just a matter of time at that point. Once enough people have those kinds of experiences, 
there is a critical mass that's reached and, and that's that. Um, But for now, uh, the refrigerator has just turned on and it's making the buzzing sound that I don't really want to deal with trying to edit that out of the video. It's not that easy to do. It, it kind of ruins the audio quality. So to save your ears and my sanity, I'm going to end this video now and I'll see you next time. Okay, bye.